Hi and welcome to episode number seven of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm. I'm Sarah Zanacroce, I'm your host here, and you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart-centered entrepreneur who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business. Or you are an entrepreneur who is simply fed up with the traditional marketing model and are ready for a paradigm shift. Today, I'm honored to bring you an interview with one of the early adopters of online business and marketing. I personally started following him in 2007 or 2008 when he was known as one of the most active bloggers. I'm talking about Chris Brogan. Today, I know Chris as a disruptor. He talks about taboo topics such as anxiety and depression, but also about the intense pressures of the digital world. We talk about his view of the current state of digital marketing and what he thinks needs to change. Chris is mostly working with big companies, but everything we discuss also applies to us entrepreneurs. And I'm so glad he actually leads the way with the big guys. This is what it says in his official bio. Chris Brogan is president of Chris Brogan Media, offering business and marketing advisory help for mid to larger sized companies. Chris is a sought after keynote speaker and the New York Times bestselling author of nine books and counting. His next book is Dented, Retrofitting Humans for the Modern Digital World. Chris has spoken for or consulted with the biggest brands you know, including Disney, Coke, Google, GM, Microsoft, Cisco, Sony, USA and many more. He's appeared on the Dr. Phil show, interviewed Richard Branson for a cover story for Success Magazine, and once even presented to a princess. People like Paolo Coelho, never know how to pronounce this name, and Harvey Mackey and Stephen Pressfield enjoy sharing their projects and best ideas with Chris because they know he'll share them with you. Tony Robbins had Chris on his Internet Money Master Series and Stat Social rated Chris the number three power influencer online. And despite all these big names and impressive projects, he remains just a nice guy and I really enjoyed our casual conversation which I will share with you in just a minute. But before, I wanted to let you know that I have just released an online-only version of the Gentle Marketing Revolution program. That's right. As you know, I'm an introvert, and launching a live program three times per year is exhausting, even for an extrovert. So I've decided to reduce the number of live runs to twice per year and instead opened up the online-only program. You get access to the same content in the customer hub. You just go through it at your own pace. And of course, there's a forum where you can ask questions. So to check out the full details of the Gentle Marketing Revolution program, you can go over to thegentlemarketingrevolution.com. I'll also link to that in the show notes. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the one and only Chris Brogan. Hey, Chris, how are you? Best day of my life. How are oh, you? Oh, wow. Yes. I wouldn't say best day, but it's a good day. Chris, the title of the show that you're on is called The Gentle Business Revolution, where we discuss how to market your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm. Now, you've been talking about a different way of marketing for a while as well. And what does this new marketing paradigm look like to you? And what do you think is key for entrepreneurs and online business owners going forward? I feel like with the rise of all the new technology that we've seen over the past 11 or more years, I feel like there's two ways that people approach it. One is that, hey, great, we can be even more robotic. We can treat everyone more the same. We could be as generic as we humanly could. Or... I think there's such a great opportunity to be very relationship minded and to use every single tool we have to really be specific and reach the person we really most want to serve and sell. And I think that most companies, it's like a spectrum. And I think most companies are leaning a little too far towards how much can we automate and I feel like there's so much opportunity for how much can we personalize. And I 
my dedication to business for the last many years, the most simplest way I've ever explained it to people is I just want every company in the world to treat my mom better. And I think that <laughs> I like that's that. a great method to yeah. explaining how companies can work better. Right. Yeah, that's so interesting because our parents' generation, they're really struggling with this automization. And, and my mom still sends me emails saying, why did they know my first name and things like that? So I really get that. And, you know, like Facebook bots and all of these things, they're like, how does that make them feel, right? It's really about how it makes people feel. And it, it's so interesting because you've been in this online space for long enough that you've seen the evolution and it's almost like we hit this spot where it's like, what are we doing? Yes, it's great to have the internet, but what are we really doing? Let's go back to relationships and human connection and, and all of that, right? And there's another opportunity. There's so many opportunities and spaces where we are happy for sort of a faster faceless connection. You know, grocery stores, there are so many, you know, robotic checkouts now. You know, when you when you go and you buy your food or something, you don't have to speak to a human if you don't want. Yeah. And really at this point, it's not that big a difference, uh, you know, between the two experiences there. And I don't think people complain. So I feel like if a company wants to automate certain parts of their business, they can. But it really becomes a question of, and where would it best serve them? to apply that human touch because they're, you know, customer service, for instance, we use so much automation to try to keep people from talking to us. But isn't that when a customer is most frustrated? I mean, no one calls customer service because they're so excited the product works well. No. So yeah. why not make that the most human part of the touch, for instance? Right. And is that kind of what you're working on with companies? With companies, a lot of what I'm trying to do is that, but also how do we reach and communicate in a way that earns that right to reach in, out and sell and serve? So how do we tell the story that the buyer is feeling? We've done a lot. I think business is really set up to try to teach people to fit into the business's story. And I think we're tired of fitting in. And I think we want to go where we feel like we belong. <laughs> so now uh, there's a lot of companies that are talking more about inclusivity. There are companies that are looking for how do I make sure that I represent the people I'm hoping to serve so that they see themselves in, in our advertising and in our marketing. And so I'm, I'm trying really hard for that. How do we make a story that makes a buyer go, oh, I want to work with these people because they feel like they believe what we believe. Uh, younger generations, millennials and whatnot, 78% of them choose to purchase from companies they feel share their values. Mm -hmm. And almost 90% of people in surveys now want the companies that they patronize to, to share their values in some way. Yeah. And I think the same thing goes for entrepreneurs. It's not just for bigger companies. It's also for entrepreneurs. You know, we, we kind of grew up in this online space and, and there's all these, you know, courses and templates and cookie cutter approach. Like everybody seems to be doing the same thing. What people really want is like what you said, lead with the values, because that's how I can connect with you. Like in my I call it my day job. I'm a LinkedIn consultant, right? Well, sure. there's millions of other LinkedIn consultants. So if I don't bring in my values and my story, they can work with anybody and they're probably going to go, you know, compare prices. So that's what I'm trying to do with the entrepreneurs. It's, it's also saying lead with your why, lead your, with your values, because that's how you're different from everybody else. And so that's where you get the, I like this line from Jerry McGuire, uh, you had me at hello. And I like to sit, you know, apply that in business. Like you get on a call and people are already sold because they read your about page or they read your story because it's connecting through the heart in a way. It's connecting through the values. We buy from people we like. Um, I read that first in the 1990s and it was a conversation about, it was a technology conversation. It was a, why is it so hard for people to buy uh, Linux technology, you know, instead uh -huh. of Windows or whatever. Right. And it was because when people think of Linux, they think of uh, big burly men with suspenders and big <laughs> beards and, you know, just people that you don't quite relate to unless you're one of them. Right. Uh, whereas Microsoft was a bunch of people in suits looking like business people. And so... I believe that now there's even more of that. And your point about, you know, to try to avoid the cookie cutters. It, it, it's amazing how many people think that the recipe is the dinner. The recipe is the meal. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, you and I can read the same set of instructions and execute it exactly the same. 
But really, it's what we bring to it that's going to matter and what's going to make it different. I find that I have the unfortunate opportunity to receive a lot of incoming email from people who bought some person's course. And the same course has been sold for 10 plus years. And so I get the template emails <laughs> I know, over, yeah. and over and over. And I say, yeah. look, right. thank God you spent some money with Marie Forleo. She's a wonderful person and really smart. But Marie didn't want you to copy paste the template. She wanted you to write your own. Yeah. And at this point, I, I like to call out if I know which course it is, I like to point it back to them to say, don't do that. Right. Not, not don't follow the great advice of smart people. Don't copy and paste it. Yeah. The reason I think people are doing that is because they're missing this confidence of actually showing up as themselves, right? And, and that brings me to this other topic that you addressed also on your start here page or get started or something. And that's anxiety because that's something I talk a lot about in my new marketing program as well, is this huge level of anxiety that seems to be in this online space and that maybe that's why we're trying to kind of all fit in and do the same thing. What do you think about that? There are a few uh, points that, so I talk a lot about the actual clinical term anxiety, you know, doctor type anxiety and depression and those sorts of things, because I think that we've just spent so many decades trying to hide that people have those problems. So I, I suffer from clinical depression. I, I take medication and all it does is, you know, it's that and whatever I can do with my life around it. You know, some people have diabetes. I have depression. It's the same thing. But general anxiety is highest as it has been in the world in a very, very long time. Part of it is the velocity of everything. Part of it is just some massive uncertainties in business and life. Uh, in the U.S. and in the West, for sure, this uh, financial recession is coming. And whenever the U.S. has a massive financial recession, it washes all over the rest of the planet anyway. And that stuff scares us. In that process, we try really hard. We, we look for very solid ground, I think. I think all entrepreneurs of any size, you know, one person or a company with 5,000 people, we all look for what's solid ground. And that's one of the big mistakes people make in a physical emergency is they try to stay still and not go anywhere. And they feel like if they're lost in the woods, they should stay in one spot until they're found. Mm -hmm. But that's the worst advice. You're supposed to stay moving. Mm -hmm. uh, movement is life. And I think that our best way to beat anxiety of any kind is to keep moving and to keep you know, going towards our goals. And we maybe have to shrink our goals a little. We maybe have to make uh, smaller steps, baby steps to get to those goals. But if you don't keep moving, that's when you fail. And so I think that that's my recipe to beat anxiety is just keep moving towards a goal, even if you have to change the goals a few times. Yeah, take me a bit deeper into that moving because I don't, I don't quite understand what you mean by that. Like, what if you're so anxious and that's, you're just stuck, right? So where are you going to move? <laughs> Tell me. Uh, take an action, complete emotion. So okay. when someone's super anxious and they're like, I don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. I always say, well, one great place to start is somewhere and then go somewhere else next. People are afraid that if the first step they take, they'll fail. There's two things that'll happen. One, you could fail in your first step and then just do another step. When little children learn how to walk, the first time they fall down, they don't stop. We're not a whole planet full of people laying down because we never quite mastered how to stand. So we had to go past failure at some point. With anxiety about what's going on, we have to take an action and then see what happens back, even if it's the wrong action. We could, we could you know, launch our amazing course, let's say, and no one buys. And we go, oh man, no one bought. And if you don't examine it, no one's going to buy the next time too. Let's all agree to that. Mm -hmm. However, if you could say that uh, failure is feedback, like they say, some smart people, or that failure is just a, a result you weren't expecting or that you didn't want, then you just treat it differently. We hook a lot of emotion and self-worth to whether or not we fail, but I fail 90 plus percent of the time. Mm -hmm. I fail every day. I've consistently failed in a downward revenue descent for three plus years, and now I'm going to have another good revenue year next year. Mm -hmm. So entrepreneurship is never a line that goes up. It's a line that, that bounces. And, and really, you know, I think we keep the antacid market in, in good shape. <laughs> I 
think we help the liquor market and the medical cannabis market. I think we're great for uh, mm. the world because we buy lots of drugs and we buy yoga and all these great things because it's harder for us to sit still, which is a benefit, but it's also we're going to fail more times than someone else. If you don't want to fail, it's really easy. Just don't do anything. <laughs> that's true. Uh, Before you brought up belonging, and I think that's a huge part of this sense of failure, because if we're isolated and we, you know, we just have our own little voice in our head telling us that we're a failure, rather than like we are just doing, you know, sharing, yes, we fail all the time and it's okay to fail. Don't you think that is also a big part of that anxiety is that we're even though the internet was invented to be more connected, we have become more and more isolated. And as entrepreneurs, that's just not helpful. There's a really great YouTube series. Uh, the channel's name is Charisma on Command. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the most recent ones as we we're recording this uh, is about Shia LaBeouf, the actor. Mm -hmm. And Shia has gone through multiple phases in his career. He, he was very successful. Then he was ridiculed horribly. Then he was successful again. And then he was ridiculed again. And now he just seems to be in just a great place. He's got a bunch of really successful independent films back to back that have done really well. And in this, one of the, the details they point out is the way he exudes confidence around even his flaws really changes things. And so as you were saying what you were saying, I was thinking, it's amazing how people try so hard to hide their flaws and they try so hard to, to be just like everyone else. That's not belonging. Mm -hmm. Belonging is where you find people who are the same kind of weird as you or who have the same realm of crazy as you or you both like X even though you don't agree on Y. That's what belonging is. And so I think that it's the confidence just to say, I am, uh, you know, I use a term a lot called dented. And I use dented because I think we can all admit that we have dents. You know, uh, we were abused as children or we had a terrible uh, parent or we had an uh, abusive spouse or a drug addiction or whatever we had that went wrong in our life. I have depression. There's some reason why we think we're not as good as everyone else. But as it turns out, almost 100% of people Everybody. have that. Mm. And, there, and not so many people are faking it once they get successful. The only people faking it are the unsuccessful people. That's so true. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we're wearing this mask until we are successful. And then we're like, oh, now I can dig up all these old stories because, you know, now I made it. And how does that make all the other people feel who didn't make it yet? Right. There's well, you know, I think that they're just getting their source of information from everyone else around them and or kind of trying to build their own version of what they think they're supposed to be. Right. You know, people ask me all the time, when I talk about depression so much, they're like, no one's going to hire you. And I said, well, they, well, they keep hiring me. I would like more people to hire me. But I just explain in my specific case, I explain how it doesn't impact their work. You know, I still meet my deadlines. I still do what I do. I still present as a very happy person, even when I'm the most depressed. So if I'm speaking on a stage at a keynote, it's not like I cry on the stage for 40 minutes, you know, but... I think that when we don't feel successful, when we don't feel worthy, we try to hide and hide some more and hide even more. It's, it's like uh, when we're too heavy and we go to the beach and we try to wear five shirts and everyone else is in their bathing suit. And, and I feel like, well, no one doesn't know. You know, your t-shirts don't make you invisible. They just make it clear that you're not comfortable. And I find that when uh, we can be where we are, that helps everything so much more. It's not where we want to be and it's not where we're going to be. But if we can be where we are and be okay, then we're going to be much more attractive in all senses of that term mm -hmm. than we are when we're defending. Yeah, defending or pretending. So true. Great. Well, where are you right now? Where are you making an impact? I hope everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I write a weekly newsletter that I long for the feedback that I get. So I, I love every Sunday sending out a message to see what people think about my ideas and if they can help these people in their lives. I work with clients of very different sizes, you know, sometimes one person on private coaching and sometimes a mid-sized company or sometimes the very big companies. 
and every time I do it, I, the conversation you and I had is something I've talked in different ways about with everyone I ever meet because it, the message doesn't have to change. Everyone feels that, even the most confident, most. I was talking to a billionaire. It was the first time I met a billionaire. I've met five now. The first billionaire I met, I teased him and said that his uh, speech in front of the audience, I, th- I said, I don't think they liked what you had to say. <laughs> and he got very sad very quickly. Mm. And I thought, he said, well, why? And I said back, because I was a little younger and I didn't know. I said, why do you care what they think? You're a billionaire. And he said, because that one has nothing to do with the other. Everyone wants people to like what you produce. And I said, oh. I said, I'm so sorry. I was just being dumb and funny. Right. But I learned something because I thought, if only I'm a billionaire, then I will not care what anyone thinks. It's not true. And so our definition of success, my, my last mainstream book that I wrote was called The Freaks Shall Inherit the Earth. It was about entrepreneurship. And I, I devoted two different chapters to success because I think that one of the things we, we get wrong is we think once we have our yacht, then that's success. You know, once we have two houses or whatever, once we're not worried about a bill, but billionaires have bills that they don't want to pay. <laughs> Probably bigger bills. Yeah. Much bigger, worse bills. Uh, Donald Trump, before he became a strange U.S. president, a million billion years ago, wrote a story about at one point uh, he owed almost a billion dollars to other people. And he walked by someone who was homeless and he said, I feel like this man has more money than me because he only has zero. Right. I have almost negative a billion. And I, I took that lesson for what it was worth back then thinking, you know, they say more money, more problems. I think that our version of success has to really come from inside of ourselves and what we want to line up to that will change how we feel about ourselves. It might not be that we need, you know, a Lamborghini. Turns out I don't need a Lamborghini. I'm okay. But I need to always be able to say no to projects I don't want to do. That's my definition of success. Not having to say yes to something stupid or work with people I don't like. Right. I really like the book Essentialism by uh, Greg McCowan. And uh, yeah, that taught me a lot about saying no first. Because usually what we hear is say yes to everything, right? <laughs> I'm like, uh-uh, no. The no works much better for me. Mm-hmm. I love saying no. It's a <laughs> great word. Well, I, I'm so glad you said yes to talking to me. Uh, this has been really insightful. Thanks so much for being on the show, Chris. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I personally can't wait for Chris's new book called Dented, Retrofitting Humans for the Modern Digital World. I'll keep an eye on Amazon and we'll let you know when it comes out. That's it for this episode of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast. Please find the show notes of this episode at sarazanacroce.com forward slash GBR7. All the links are in the description. So if you are listening to this episode on your favorite podcasting app, click on the description and you will find all the clickable links in there. Please also check out Chris's website at chrisbrogan.com and all the resources sources we mentioned will also be in the show notes. Next week, I'll cover the P of partnerships and we will address the power of masterminds. I really hope you'll join me on this journey to a kinder marketing paradigm. And please invite your friends to join us by sharing this podcast or the Gentle Business Manifesto with them. Both can be found at thegentlebusinessrevolution.com. Let's be the change we want to see in the world. I hope you'll tune in again next week when we talk about partnerships. And until then, I wish you an amazing week. Speak soon. Mm